All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I know more folks are going to be filing in, but I want to be mindful of our panelists' time and begin this uh, exciting event, this exciting Americanist Dinner Forum that we've got for you tonight. Uh, I'm Noah Cohan. I'm the uh, Assistant Director of American Culture Studies here at Washington University in St. Louis, and I am the interim, serving as Interim Director uh, this semester. Um, I want to welcome you all to our event, which uh, I will tell you more about in just a moment. But before I do that, if I can, I'd like to share my screen to share word of our fourth and final Americanist Dinner Forum of the spring semester for 2022. So let me see if I can do that. Here we go. So what I am showing you is that on April 21st, we'll have an American Dinner Forum, the Document Du Jour series with Annika Nilsson, who is an advanced uh, graduate student PhD candidate in anthropology. She'll be sharing some documents with us that she's puzzling over in her dissertation. Um, a notable thing about that event is that it is going to happen in person for the first time in more than two years. Our Americanist Dinner Forum event will happen in physical space uh, with each other. That event will take place at four th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. on Thursday, April 21st in Duck 234. And uh, we're excited to see everyone. Uh, please note the time, 4.30. And also, though it is still technically an Americanist dinner forum, dinner will not be served. Unfortunately, <laughs> there will be no food present. Um, so, But it should be a great event. Anyone who registers will be sent the documents, of course, to puzzle over in advance of the event and then hear how Annika is uh, working on them for her dissertation. So we hope you'll join us on April 21st for that event. All right, back to tonight's event, which we're so excited about, Equity and Inclusion Beyond the Multicultural Academy. And I want to introduce the uh, organizer of tonight's event, uh, and also the moderator of the panel that you're about to hear, Maxwell E. Greenberg, postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies here at Washington University in St. Louis. He received his PhD from UCLA through the Department of Chicano, Chicana and Central American Studies. He has developed popular curriculum and planning on US Jewish racial formation, and is currently working on a manuscript entitled The New Jewish Pioneer that explores structures of race, land, and collective memory in the US-Mexico border region. Thank you so much, Maxwell, for organizing this event. And I will turn it over to you to introduce our other wonderful panelists. Here we go. Thank you so much, Noah. Uh, Again, my name is Max Greenberg, and I'm a postdoc fellow in Jewish studies here at WashU. And I'm really excited to be facilitating tonight's dinner forum called Equity and Inclusion Beyond the Multicultural Academy. And I first wanted to just extend some gratitudes, uh, first and foremost, for all the attendees. Thank you for taking your time. Uh, we're all uh, zoomed, zoomed out. Uh, that's the understatement. And so I just really appreciate you donating some extra screen time for this talk tonight. Uh, I am housed in Jewish studies, but this program of American culture studies has been really, really supportive since my arrival at WashU. So I just want to thank that program and specifically Drs. Noah Cohan and Karen Skinner uh, and Terry Bear for all your administrative support. Uh, I also want to thank my hosting department, Jewish, Islamic, and Middle Eastern Studies for supporting my training as a, as a teacher and a student uh, of race and religion, and my mentors, uh, Drs. Flora Kasson and Nancy Berg. Uh, and for everyone in attendance tonight, please feel free to add your questions uh, or comments or curiosities in either the chat uh, or the Q&A, which I'll be moderating and will shift uh, about after 50 minutes or so, 50 to 60 minutes of, uh, of discussion amongst our panelists. And uh, last but not least, a huge, huge thank you and tremendous gratitude from our, our three panelists. I've already learned so much from just being in conversation with you uh, over the last few months planning this event. Uh, so first, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Kikivik who is a popular educator of Mayan roots organizing in Chumash territory. Dr. Kikivik places her university training in geography at the service of under-resourced communities who seek 
tools to build and strengthen their collective autonomies. She's currently working on a popular book entitled, and I'm so excited for this, Palestine 1492, which places the Palestinian struggle in conversation with resistance movements in the Americas over the last 500 years. Uh, next, we have a dear colleague and thought partner, Jesse Stuhlman, who is a graduate student at UCLA in the Department of Anthropology uh, of White Jewish Descent living in the Arapaho and Cheyenne Territory. Jesse's project focuses on how the Moroccan archival landscape shapes collective memory of Black Jewish history. And she has published academic and non-academic writing in international journals, including Hesperus uh, Tamuda, I'm sorry, Jesse, you're going to have to correct uh, all my mistakes there, and Asim Asimptote. Asimptote. You're, you also might have to correct that one. I apologize for not practicing in advance. Uh, Jesse aspires to join the publishing world to encourage, to join the publishing world to encourage accessibility in academic writing. And last but not least, we have Nancy Ko, who is an interdisciplinary historian of environment and capitalism in the global Mediterranean. Nancy is a recipient of the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans and is currently pursuing her PhD in the Department of History at Columbia University, where her work explores the intersections of Jewish life, loss, and memory with Mediterranean trajectories of racial capitalism. Nancy can be heard in conversation with recent authors in history, Asian American studies, Jewish studies, and Middle Eastern studies, over at the New Books Network. And we really recommend that podcast here. All right, so next we're gonna shift to what uh, typically in any uh, University of California uh, event, um, which is where my training is from, as well as uh, Jesse, um, the, the, the moment where we acknowledge native land, the native land that we're on. Um, right, but this uh, event today is thinking about beyond multicultural frameworks. Um, now, I wanted to start with the native land acknowledgement to start off this discussion on multiculturalism, uh, because I believe it's one of the most recent consequences of multicultural frameworks uh, and how they operate in the neoliberal academy in the United States. Now, for anyone who has never heard of this practice, native land acknowledgments uh, means a practice of naming the ancestral or indigenous ways of naming the land on which we stand. Uh, and for many of us, that means also acknowledging that we might be settlers or uninvited guests on the unceded territory of, uh, for example, the Osage Nation, um, for those of us zooming in from present day St. Louis. Now, like other limitations of multicultural neoliberalism, the institutionalization of native land acknowledgements does very little to highlight the ways that settler colonial processes, um, the same processes that legalized um, land theft from the Osage Nation in 1808, uh, on which Washington University's Danforth campus is built, that these same processes are still operating today, that they're not just existing in the past, right? That anti-Black and anti-Native imperatives of 19th century westward expansion uh, are not historical topics, but remain central to the ways in which WashU as an administrative institution engages with and shapes housing inequalities, access to healthcare, and racialized surveillance and policing in St. Louis to this day. Conveniently, um, none of these urgent and current social problems are made visible by acknowledging that the Osage Nation uh, is this land's ancestral inhabitants. And I want to say that represent representational politics is a, an intentional magic trick. Uh, of multicultural education under late stage capitalism. Now, if we're gonna imagine other possibilities for a land acknowledgement under neoliberalism, we're gonna name that the space that we're all currently occupying is a virtual one that is managed, mediated, and monetized by 
the company Zoom. Now, acknowledging that Zoom's headquarters is currently and non-consensually occupying the unceded territory of the Ohlone peoples, present day uh, South Bay Area, this is, a, this is a useful starting point um, for a call to stay vigilant to the ways that Zoom benefits from and perpetuates settler colonial dynamics in the present, and especially since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And just one example of how Zoom participates in settler colonialism today that is uniquely relevant to our forum is the censorship of Palestinian activist Leila Khalid at a seminar hosted in March 2020 by San Francisco State University. Much of today's conversation was inspired by an increasingly explicit, though by no means new pattern amongst university administrators across public and private institutions to align themselves both economically and politically with Christian, Jewish, and secular Zionist lobby groups. And as was demonstrated most recently and very publicly by the removal of Palestinian histories from the ethnic studies model curriculum in California's K through 12 public ed system, meaningful and enduring equity and inclusion in US education is too easily managed and manipulated by private third parties with deep investments in upholding the same inequalities that imperialism always produces. But if there is something I have learned from our brilliant panelists already, it's there's little value in offering this structural critique that I just gave without also shifting towards alternative possibilities, right? And that imagining uh, what else is possible is really hard because the academy as a kind of agent or conduit of empire keeps us really comfortably in the square, in the realm of, of critique, um, where we're encouraged to tear down and deconstruct, um, but the work of dreaming and imagining and recreating um, can feel at best maybe unproductive and at worst uh, completely beyond our skill sets. Uh, but one of our objectives today is to remember our inherited human capacities to imagine and employ these capacities inside of an academic space, starting with an alternative possibility uh, to the neoliberal land acknowledgement. One way we might begin such an acknowledgement is by naming that Zoom's material requirements are based on a settler past, right? That Ohlone land remain stolen but we must also shift towards a more meaningful consciousness that Zoom also requires a settler present and future. That banning Khalid's voice and the subsequent events organized in protest of Khalid's censorship, Zoom's choices reflect how digital technologies can be useful to imperialism because of their capacities to silence the racialized violence of empire building. Zoom selectively deplatforms anti-colonial indigenous voices. This is a warning that settler structures are always adapting to uh, and against resistance movements. And this instance, we're witnessing how tech companies profit off urgent and ongoing needs to gather and organize virtually and across physical distances. So a meaningful conclusion to a land acknowledgement in the academy might refuse ongoing settler colonial relations through an explicit call to action. Moving from structural critique and towards meaningful material change is of specific importance to those of us who are animated by a question uh, first posed by indigenous scholar, um, Tongva scholar, Dr. Charles Sepulveda. How can settlers support a decolonial abolitionist future by practicing being guests of tribal people and more importantly, the land itself. So I'm gonna briefly share my screen and offer some, these are some ideas and resources about how to activate a land acknowledgement in the present. Uh, and we're gonna start with one example is supporting efforts for rematriation. The Sigoreti Land Trust is an urban indigenous 
led land trust based in the San Francisco Bay Area that facilitates the return of indigenous lands to indigenous people on stolen Ohlone land where Zoom headquarters exists. And this process of territorial and human restoration is known as rematriation. And this organization created something called the Shumi Land Tax, which invites non-Indigenous peoples to support the Segoretis' work of rematriation for current and future generations of Indigenous peoples in the Bay Area. Another possibility is to research and teach about your home institution's past and present relationships to legalize land theft. In-depth scholarship featured on sites like Land Grab U offer really great models for how curriculum can teach us about the history of American universities and the expropriation of native lands and how we might organize against ongoing settler dynamics across our education institutions. And finally, another option is supporting legal protections for movement leaders and organizations struggling for indigenous sovereignty both locally and transnationally. Uh, as my opening anecdote at SF State and the censorship of Khalid reminds us, pro-Palestinian narratives are often most vulnerable to public and private efforts to censor. And organizations like Chicago-based Palestine Legal offer resources and aids to those in the United States who speak out for Palestinian freedom and yet experience unequal First Amendment protections as a result. So this is by no means an exhaustive list, and I really invite our panelists and attendees to share their own ideas and resources in the chat box for how we might start to activate land acknowledgements as an ongoing uh, and material solidarity practice, especially for non-Native peoples. All right, so now I'm gonna transition into our discussion uh, and then hand it over to our panelists. Uh, as advertised, tonight's dinner forum is a direct response to recent debates over ethnic studies and CRT in K-12 curriculum and higher education, and particularly the way that certain groups' histories are used to delegitimize the historical and contemporary experiences of other groups. And what, like we saw in the struggle over the ethnic studies model curriculum in California, uh, this recent and very public example uh, shows how one set of historical narratives, specifically Holocaust and Jewish American or Jews of color history, and these are Jews, Jewish Americans with uh, ancestry to Southwest Asia and North Africa or the Swana region. Uh, so the way that Holocaust and uh, Jewish Swana histories are weaponized by and large by non-educators to exclude Palestinian histories Palestinian American histories from public education. And the use of Jewish histories to legitimize Jewish nationalism is not new historically, nor to me personally. And the erasure of Palestinian experiences um, was also central to my California education nearly 20 years ago. Now at my K through 12th Jewish day school in Northern California, uh, I was taught a version of history that foregrounded the oppression of my European Jewish ancestors and our right to territorial and uh, sovereignty and self-determination while erasing the violence on which Jewish sovereignty in Palestine relies. And I graduated from this school in 2003 and the current debates over educational diversity and inclusivity clarify that Jewish American history remains co-opted often by methods and pedagogies that affirm imperialist narratives. But nevertheless, and as my, uh, you know, my postdoctoral position su su should suggest, I'm deeply committed to Jewish studies because I long for stories of a Jewish past that help us imagine a Jewish present and future beyond nationalism. And gathering in spaces such as this one today can help orient and ground my scholarly practice in ways I hope to be, in the words of our panelists, Dr. Kikivik, useless to empire making. Now, my personal and professional commitments aside, this zero-sum method of historiography is not unique to Jewish studies nor Jewish history, but is deeply rooted in how the United States 
and empires writ large historicize themselves. Now, our ancestral, our ancestral inheritances and particularities are valuable to this idea of America only insofar as they affirm an origin story of the US as an exceptional moral liberal democracy and a nation of immigrants. And the university has long acted on behalf of empire and legitimized a version of US history that forgets or apologizes or consents to colonial violence. And our panelists today are gonna to enter this discussion about historical amnesia and educational justice as it evolved in the post-World War II period all the way up to the present. And we're gonna begin our timeline with the arrival of the interdisciplines, uh, what would, we currently would call ethnic Jewish women and gender studies in the mid 20th century. Because this moment of arrival is fundamental to understanding the origins and limits of multicultural models of equity and inclusion in the university. So following this context, we're gonna discuss how these processes of minority reorganization and absorption by the multicultural academy actually keep us very isolated and divided. And finally, we're gonna explore how existing methods of teaching and scholarship um, that don't shy away from historical contradictions uh, but rather place value on difference and nuance as critical teaching, learning, and organizing tools of liberatory struggles. So my first question to the panelists are, how has multicultural education informed how you were formally taught about your own ancestral histories? You can think about what was foregrounded, what was silenced, uh, and how have those experiences and narratives shaped your own world and your work as educators and researchers. All right, and if anyone feels called to jump in, um, go ahead or I can call on somebody. I'm not gonna. Oh no, go, go ahead, Nancy. No, 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 please. You're go good. No, you can go. Okay, you muted first. <laughs> you beat me to the punch. Um, thank you so much, Max, for gathering us and Noah as well. And, um, you know, I love, you all know that I love being in conversation with you all. So I actually wanted to start my comments. Um, I, I love this question you asked, Max, about um, uh, how we've been shaped ourselves by imperial discourses of multiculturalism. And I wanted to begin with this sentence by the Asian American Studies scholar Candace Chu. Um, she writes, the contemporary model minority is, in short, a figure and a lived subjectivity that emerges itself at the conjuncture of the rise of global capitalism and US neo-imperialism. And I bring this up because um, part of what I want to emphasize today is the fluidity of racial formations, right? And particularly the ways that racial formations are fluid because of conflation between racial identity and anti-imperial resistance, right? And I wanna start by saying, you know, my family comes from a rural, a small island off the coast of South Korea, what is now South Korea, um, the 51st United, State, United States, you know, state given um, US military presence there, one might say. Um, and, you know, because we came from this island, Jeju, Jeju, -do, Jeju Island, off the coast of uh, the mainland, we were in a sense a minority within a minority. But when we arrived, when my family, I was born here, but when my family arrived um, to New York City um, in the late 80s, um, because of the sort of grammar of American racialization, we were slotted into this sort of, you know, Cold War slash post-Cold War notion of the model minority, right? And so I think what's interesting has been the ways in which this sort of conjuncture of, on the one hand, the experience of US imperialism, right? Literally, you know, in my own family's, nuclear family's lifetime. Yet on the other hand, the sort of tempting embrace, I might say, one might say, of model minority discourse once arriving in the US is something that cannot be understood fully without keeping in mind the ways in which American racial board, American racialization does not obey um, US borders. In fact, that it's, its very logic 
is structured by US military imperialism abroad, right? It is not a coincidence, for example, that um, Koreans, Korean Americans are considered a subset of the American model minority at the exact same period of time when we went, the, South Korea specifically, went from being the only country to go from being a recipient of loans from the OECD to a giver of loans from the OECD, right? So the global sort of capitalistic structure of, you know, post occupation post-imperial countries and their sort of economic paths in the sort of pattern of the IMF itself reflects <laughs> um, racial dynamics within the US and vice versa, right? And so I wanted to just say those, those two things, um, the conflation of race and resistance and, and keeping a sort of global scale when we think about um, this problem that, that Kiki brought up in an earlier conversation about being use, how to be useless to American empire as, as a way to start. There's a lot more to say, but I just wanted to put those two things on the on the map. Thank you so much for that, Nancy. I'll I'll take the baton now. Uh, so the question: How is how is multicultural education? How was I shaped by multicultural education in my own history? Uh, my my family comes from the geography now called Guatemala. We are of Mayan roots, but because these colonial projects of Mexico, Guatemala, all of the states in the Americas are inherently anti-Indigenous and anti-Black projects, my family learned anti-Indigeneity and anti-Blackness in that way, and so denied for the longest time that we have any kind of roots in any Indigeneity. And just, just, just look toward Europe, toward Spain, and that's very common in in Latin America, uh, where where like it, I mean, if you see just the popular culture coming out of Mexico, for example, with the soap operas, you think that everyone in Mexico is blonde and, and white, and I mean that that is just it's not unlike in the U.S. It's it's such similar logic, even if the language is spoken or different. They're all colonial projects. So then migrating to the U.S. Uh, uh, undocumented, I, I today organize with a lot of undocumented communities and folks and find it to be uh, really difficult to talk about resistance, rebellion, creating other ways because there's so much trauma. And I think that that's so similar to what you're referencing, Nancy, and just like once you migrate here, you find out that the way to survive is to not make any waves. You just assimilate in. And so then what I learned when I was growing up in, in schools, although we didn't have ethnic studies at all in, in the schools in California yet, like now it's about to happen, but that's something I didn't get until college. I was very much inspired to assimilate into whiteness. Uh, the more education that I received, the more higher education I received, the more I was being welcomed into white middle class, upper middle class elite spaces and removed more and more from my community, the more higher ed I got, but still being able to have the mantle of being the spokesperson for my community, a community that I wasn't expected to live with, struggle with anymore. But it, I, you know, you, you feel like you're like a checkbox, like the, the cliche token in, in that way, although a lot of people don't talk about it. A lot of folks, people of color in the university, black people, indigenous people who have gotten involved in this work in the university since ethnic studies was a battle that was that was won to have our histories learned in universities uh most of what i what i experienced was careerism trying to be the the scholar the spokesperson the famous person for your community and and not resisting not critiquing the bigger project of empire and instead adding to this discourse that we hear a lot with multicultural um, ethnic studies is like the whole parade, one month black people, another month brown people, another month women, another month, you know, just like going on a parade and worse, the parade is about celebrating all of the ways that we have contributed to empire. Like that that is the way that we are supposed to find acceptance in, in, in this country. So. Uh, the way that multicultural education shaped me initially was precisely on the assimilationist path toward whiteness. Thank goodness, thank goodness in uh, 
in undergrad and more in graduate school, as I was becoming more and more critical of the world, I was able to join up with movement folks in Palestine and Chiapas in the US. And I was raised very differently in that way. So I, you know, I, I consider my I talk about how I'm I'm politically raised by Palestinians, Zapatistas, Panthers, and Jaguars, Jaguars of the Maya world, where I've I've learned a whole other way of being. Uh, which has allowed me then to dream of something else. So that's something else that you're talking about, Max, I think should be what our ethnic studies curricula does, but sadly what it does instead is it just continues push, pulling us into the system and removing our imaginations, debilitating us from dreams, from dreaming about what else could be. So that has been my trajectory. And so today what I hope to do is to open up paths so that folks can have other trajectories or they're not just channeled into that one and, and hence my work as a popular educator toward that goal. I'll pass it on over to Jesse. Thank you, Kiki, and thank you everyone for this amazing start to today. Um, so how has multicultural education shaped me? Well, not super dissimilar to Max, um, although not um, brought up in the same sort of Jewish institutions. I was sort of taught to admire how all of my Ashkenazi relatives came to the US with nothing. Although upon personal research, it turns out that many of them came with plenty um, and, you know, assimilated into whiteness and, and or, you know, and, into success, right, is the term that I hear used most often. And I think I was always growing up in Michigan, surrounded by some of the largest communities from Swana in the US, I also was surrounded by another community seemingly um, being pushed to accept a similar narrative of assimilate into whiteness and be proud. Like I remember very clearly in our history course to uh, in my high school, Pioneer High School, if anybody's from Ann Arbor, um, two whole weeks dedicated to um, Ford Motor Company and not one section of that those you know lessons dedicated to his you know social darwinist <laughs> thinkings or anything like that but instead how he so generously brought over all these yemenis to work in factories doing manual labor um to help stir development in our region so um i think that's how multicultural education has most shaped me and being from a quote unquote mixed family because we have one relative who's non-Jewish and seeing how um, ashamed my parents were of being parts of Jewish institutions because of that one relative. I was also kind of curious about the conditions of acceptance and belonging um, in these sort of Jewish institutions that I think further made me wonder why these rigid boundaries, have they always existed? Um, doesn't seem possible. I don't think my great grandparents are the first folks to, you know, um, transgress or whatever. So yeah, that's how I've gotten here. And I guess um, going forward for today's discussion, I just kind of would like to think more about the possibilities, particularly from my standpoint and um, Maghreb or North African Jewish studies for the possibilities of seeing, of deconstructing how whiteness has inflected um, North African um, histories in the US education system and how we can deconstruct that. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Kiki. And thank you, Jesse. Uh, I think, Jesse, you set up uh, a perfect segue to my next question, um, which is about kind of how your training as uh, scholars, teachers, um, researchers, re researchers has been um, informed by kind of the multicultural turn in academia. Um, you're all from um, more traditional disciplines, uh, geography, history, and anthropology. Um, and Although I'm from an ethnic studies department, Ch uh, Chicano and Chicano studies, um, what we've been talking about is kind of this arrival of the interdisciplines um, didn't really uh, simultaneously meant a, a reframing of oppositional movements and discourse and action and um, organizing 
uh, into something useful to empire, um, right? So I don't want to hold ethnic studies up as some model that these more traditional disciplines should catch up to because we know they're all um, operating within a multicultural framework right now. Um, so I'm curious if each one of you can talk about um, kind of how your disciplines um, uh, re either reinforced or maybe agitated a multicultural model. Um, how were they thinking about difference and power if they were? Um, how are they thinking about justice and liberation and dreaming, uh, not only as concepts, but as a, a teaching practice that we can use in the classroom? Um, and where does your field, where do your fields, um, you know, across our public education and in higher ed, where do they need to do better? I can start at the end. Um, and I should just say, I, I think I should say a few more words about how uh, my background actually led me to my academic fields, um, all of which are extremely shaped by the dynamics we're talking about. So Jewish studies, Middle East studies and history, uh, of course. Um, but uh, it was actually precisely because of the um, analogies, the, the the analogical experiences I was, I was having as a sort of so-called model minority you know, um, growing up in a, you know, post-Soviet Russian Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn has half Italian Catholic, half Russian Jewish, that I started to actually um, go to Jewish studies out of an optimism that thinking about Jewishness as a sort of, you know, uh, metaphor for otherness would get me to understand, you know, the experiences that I was having, right, as a, as a, as a Korean American, as an Asian American, um, in a largely Ashkenazi Jewish um, but also white American Jewish setting, right? And what, I mean, and I, part of this, of course, I'm saying retrospectively, but I think what's so interesting is who has and has not been included within disciplinary Jewish studies, right? Um, who have come to it for those same reasons, right? And so, you know, I know, I know in previous conversations, Jesse has pointed this out, right? But the Jewish studies itself was, was founded thinking about like, secularized Wissenschaft the student terms in Germany, um, precisely in the sort of model of liberal inclusion, right, and assimilation, okay. And so what's been interesting to me is, is, you know, through the course of my scholarship to be tracing the work of scholars like Moshe Pistone, um, who theorized that um, contemporary modern, you know, European antisemitism is the personification of the negative effects of capitalism is, in other words, fetishized anti-capitalism, right? Um, and, and, and noticing the ways in which his work appears and then disappears, right? Within fields of, within, within the sort of journals and in Jewish studies, right? And where it's actually cropped up again has actually been in the more critical sort of avenues of Asian American studies, right? So scholars like um, the Japanese American scholar Aiko Day and her work, Alien Capital, who analogizes this process of anti-Semitism with how anti-Asian racism is bound up with um, capitalism in the US, right? And so that sort of is, is one thread of, you know, where I think Jewish studies has foreclosed um, certain potential avenues of critique, right? And it's sort of its maximal potential. How can we think about Jewish studies not as just about Jews, quote unquote, but rather about what following the sort of paths of Jewish belonging and exclusion can tell us about how empire and capitalism functions, what the social implications of these forms of domination are. But so when I went to, um, when I pursued my undergraduate studies, I um, knew that I wanted to pursue Jewish history. I thought I knew I wanted to pursue Jewish history. And so I um, started to actually study Hebrew, which was itself in a way a conflation of Jewishness with the idea of Israel, right? Modern Hebrew, that is. Um, and, I, and what was fascinating for me is that, you know, at the same time, I was also getting involved in anti occupation activism on Palestine, specifically within my university's Hillel. And I realized that this question of, you know, who is and is not a sanctions member, let's say, of Jewish studies was actually just the surface, was actually just a microcosm of a broader sociological issue, which is who do we and do we not consider properly a Jew, right? Because within Harvard, within my undergraduate university's halal, what was fascinating to observe 
um, and heartbreaking actually in many ways was how fellow you know, Jewish colleagues um, who resisted um, occupation in, in, in Palestine and Israel um, were in many ways socially, informally and formally sidelined within the institution as such, right? And so when I was an undergraduate, I and a number of colleagues, friends, um, we co-founded this movement called Open Halal, which was to um, basically remove Halal International's standards of partnership because we realized that this sort of social atmosphere in which even Jews could not you know, articulate um, points of view that were critical of, of military occupation in Palestine, right? Um, we're not allowed to speak publicly um, in Jewish spaces, at sanctioned Jewish spaces on, on college campuses. That this was this entire sort of thing was an outgrowth of a larger policy on the part of this sort of large philanthropy, um, which was to say, if you do not explicitly support a two-state solution, um, which as a historian I find <laughs> hilariously short-sighted, but if you do not support explicitly a two-state solution, um, or, or you support BDS, um, you are not allowed to sort of speak publicly um, within Harvard, within Hello International as, as a whole, right? And, you know, part of what I found so destructive about these guidelines is that you will not find a meaningful, any form of meaningful Palestinian solidarity that does not involve BDS, right? So what this, what these guidelines were doing essentially um, was excluding Palestinians and Palestinian viewpoints from Halal without having to say that they were doing as much, right? Without having to violate Title VI, essentially, right? And so, again, what we were seeing here, you know, similar to sort of the history of Asian American formation is, was a conflation, right, between um, certain forms of identity and certain political groups. And noticing the ways in which who is Jewish or considered Jewish by official institutions was itself narrowed by what was considered to be politically kosher or not, right? The last thing I want to speak on is Middle East studies, which is of course the, you know, hotbed of Cold War politics, um, you know, founded by US State Department, um, you know, uh, well, I don't want to say spies, but, you know, <laughs> officials, let's say. Um, and I think what's so interesting is the mutual exclusions, actually, between different area studies, between Middle East studies and Asian, Amer Asian American studies, let's say, which is an ethnic studies discipline, or between Middle East studies and East Asian studies, precisely because of these sort of Cold War divisions, and even against the sort of attempts of young ethnic studies scholars in the 60s and 70s to resist um, these very sort of modes of knowledge production, right? And so I think one of the things that we still have yet to comprehend fully is how it is that we went from a history where Ottoman subjects of the Middle East were freely migrating to the US while Chinese immigrants were barred, right? And then at some point in the 20th century, this flipped, right? And so we had the model minority Asian American, but then due to a number of sort of developments in international politics, we had to, to put it euphemistically, right? We also had the sort of emergence of novel forms, not, not totally new forms, but novel forms certainly of Islamophobia, right? And so I think part of the challenge for all of us within ethnic studies and area studies um, is to tear apart, to dissolve these borders between US history and quote unquote world history, precisely because they were made to stymie solidarities, anti-imperial solidarities in the global South, in East Asia, in in the Middle East uh, or Swana and so on and so forth. And the last thing I'm going to say is that I think that this question of, because the sort of, I came to realize the question was really like, who gets to count as a Jew and who doesn't get to count as a Jew? The challenge that I pose to Jewish studies is actually to be, what would it mean to care about subjects who are not Jewish? And how would that change the way in which we write Jewish history? Which has obvious implications in Palestine, but I think also has implications um, everywhere where there is a, a Jewish diaspora. Thank you for that, Nancy. I, I want to rip off that um, in within in, within my response. So my I'm the I'm the one with the geography discipline, and the way that my discipline I mean the way that I've related to my discipline and the way that my discipline has related to the world is the w geography like anthropology is a very colonial discipline. That's its roots. Luckily. Uh, 
there have been some openings in them uh, in geography to have this branch of critical geography that has Marxist, feminists, and anarchists in it, who were, uh, like many disciplines, were influenced by the movements of the 60s and 70s. And there are these renegade scholars there who uh, articulate outside the discipline quite a bit. And so they have a lot of citations. And you know that the political economy of the academy is if you get cited a lot, then people have to pay attention to you, whether they like you or not. That's actually been really great for geography because uh, you have to deal with the critique of capital, the critique of the state, and the critique of patriarchy. Uh, in just a regular geography seminar, you need to deal with it whether you like it or not, because it's it's part of the conversation. And uh, just and, and I just wanted to highlight that for any of for those of y'all who are in the university, there are ways that you can push conversations, but you know, by studying the ways that it's already happened in other disciplines. Geography itself is a very interdisciplinary discipline, uh, particularly in the theoretical space, it, because it, it deals with the question of space space, place. For me, I was interested in the question of borders because I hate borders. So I wanted to study everything that I could about them. It led me to study maps really critically, the nation state very critically. It led me to Palestine to write a dissertation about how we even got to the point where what we're doing is talking about borders, which is something that's very, it's taken for granted in that movement, not just in that movement, but so many of our movements uh, where we just begin politics with empire, that's the starting point for politics. And we're not studying empire as a, as a conjuncture of, of things that happen that are not inevitable, right? It's not natural. There was There's fighting and resistance for it to take place. And therefore there's fighting and resistance for something else to take place, for something else to be created. So I thought that that was really powerful about geography. Um, I, I, I also did Middle East studies while I was doing geography and Latin American studies. In my master's, I did Latin American studies on, on, uh, Guat on Guatemalan transnational migrants. I was really surprised moving into Middle East studies how there was zero conversation about capitalism or neoliberalism when I began. Zero conversation about resistance or rebellion or, or much less revolution, the way that there was and that there is in Latin American studies. Not to say that Latin American studies is just better. It's just that in Latin America, I think they're, they, they're having to deal with all of the rebellions taking place there that haven't ceased. And that then shapes the discourse of what academia talks about. Now in Middle East studies, people are talking about revolution because of the Arab Spring. Before it was just Islam and the hijab. That was, that was like basically the two great topics of interest of everyone. And um, I kind of felt a pretty, pretty, pretty out, out on the margins because of what I was studying. I was very interested in this question of revolution. So then to see after 2011, the same academics who are poo-pooing revolutionary speak now being experts on revolution, it was quite <laughs> surprising. I mean, you know, listening to them, I, I really couldn't believe what I was what, like. They, there was zero humility there about, oh, you know, I didn't think this. Let me go read. Let me just be quiet and listen. There was none of that immediately the next night, the next morning. They were the experts. So um, in ethnic studies, too, uh, because I started to think a lot about the question of race in a, a struggle that's usually talked about as a question of, of nationalism. I started to talk, I think, a lot about the question of race in terms of how borders divide, not just states, but us from each other in ways that are incredibly disrespectful and ways that understand that we're all potentially enemies and we need a border in order to, to live in peace. And I noticed in ethnic studies what I was noticing as participating in the Palestine Solidarity Movement in the United States. Now, this was right after 9-11. And what my personal experience was, was with a lot of Arab Americans, they didn't want anything to do with migrant struggle or black struggle, zero, zero. And I think it's because they had been classified and treated as white, they had fought for that for decades. And then 9-11 kind of overnight in the popular imagination just stripped them from their whiteness and uh we're not trying to go with the below instead we're trying to go above again 
With Ferguson, that changed. I think with the younger generation of Arab Americans who've always been racialized since 9-11, it's a lot easier for them to connect with us. So I see this shift. And so in thinking about ethnic studies and the way that that, that discipline has, be, has begun to articulate a lot with Palestine from a lot of the work that many of us have done to force it into the conversation with the rest of our struggles. In California, there was the model ethnic studies curriculum that some of my friends were a part of. And I was once surprised at how uh, that they, that, you know, I was happy to see that Palestine had been included, but I was surprised at how little study they had done on the fallout when you talk, when you speak publicly in support of Palestinians as human beings, just like everybody else. That's a huge backlash and they, they weren't prepared for that. And I also noticed in the ethnic studies curriculum that there wasn't a discussion about whiteness, about how Arabs were not fought to be white and then weren't white anymore. Instead, like Palestine in Arab American history was just put in there as if just naturally we're always in the position of the below. Uh, and that also then missed the opportunity to talk about how Jewish people have become white as well and how Jewish studies has resisted understanding itself as an ethnic studies field, resisted being part of other struggles as well. And I think that it's really important to point these things out, like how I pointed out of my own personal history, how I was moving toward assimilating into whiteness, like how we know that this is how so many people from below, the only response that we're allowed is to go above, which means keeping others below, right? And I think that if we can talk about this logic and the ways that we are all positioned into it, where that's our only possible response, I think that that can be a lot more helpful than just talking about like ethnic studies as this group's oppressed, this group's oppressed, this group's, without having an analysis of how that happens. I'll leave my comments there. All right, uh, I just find my, my neck's gonna be sore because I keep just nodding my head in rigorous agreement. Um, so I guess I just, I wanna restate something Nancy said, what would it mean to care about subjects who are not Jewish? And I gotta say that really hit deep um, because I think that's what brought me personally to anti-Zionist activism when I was younger is I wondered like, why so much navel gazing? I was just a little confused uh, from my own family. And um, especially considering that we lived in this place where like plenty of our neighbors were Palestinian, didn't appear to be any problem. What the hell, you know? And my little 18 year old sense, I was like, well, let me be an anti-Zionist and um, then get to know this beautiful genealogy of anti-Zionists who themselves, like we've been talking about, have been included or excluded um, frequently from kind of canonical Jewish studies um, <laughs> pedagogy. And that brought me to medieval studies where I was like, let me go ahead and romanticize Al-Andalus and find my decolonial future out of this pre-colonial past, right? Which like, what a <laughs> what a stereotype. I recognize it's the way it happened. Um, and of course, though, through that experience, number one, to Max's original question, from medieval studies, which of course the word medieval itself is teleological and problematic, at least I knew that the idea of disciplines was BS, excuse my language, <laughs> but like, you know, just a few centuries ago, there was no real difference between all of these disciplines that we now herald as like totally siloed separate vacuums. Um, and anyways, eventually I get to anthropology and I guess um, similar to what Kiki was saying, what I do find productive where I am and maybe because I have to, because I'm here <laughs> is that this discipline because of its very clear colonial origins must continually contend with its participation in the creation of scientific racism. Um, and similarly, my background in medieval studies has to contend with its obfuscation of ideas of racialization that are not based in biology, but based in notions of religion, notions of environment, climatology, whatever. So I got to come into these two disciplines that each like 
had some stuff that they really still need to deal with and constantly still need to deal with. But I also don't like, and I think similar to my panelists, the sort of you know narcissistic focus on, well, what does my discipline need to do to decolonize or, or that discipline? All, all these disciplines are products of the colonial university system, right? Um, and then I guess in terms of Middle Eastern studies, what I found because I was so focused on Andalus, which then brought me to North Africa, I was like, wow, they do not know what to do with North Africa. <laughs> they do not know where this fits. So, and I'm talking about Middle Eastern studies. Is it Africa? Are they black? Are they brown? Are they white? <laughs> you know, what are we supposed to do? And so in that sense, I do think lots of scholars coming out of um, North African studies more particularly did have to contend more than your average expert on Iraq or Syria with notions of race and racialization, not only also because 1441, very first Portuguese Atlantic slave trading post is made, is established in Cap Bujador in what today we call Morocco. So, you know, um, I do, and I think that's what also brings me to this discussion is, you know, part of when we say, oh, we need a, you know, the groups, for example, who were really upset about the California ethnic studies curriculum say, oh, well, we need to highlight Middle Eastern Jewish studies. I almost immediately know they are not talking necessarily about North African Jewish studies, for example, because how do they fit in this idea of the Middle East necessarily? Um, and yeah, I guess there was, I had so many notes. Who was properly a Jew? also speaks very deep into my heart. Um, and, and to this point about Jewish studies resisting ethnic studies, I really appreciate that you brought that up because for me, and I think for Max as well, that's something that's really generated our, you know, been generative for our own work because following, you know, the sort of gutting of the original ethnic studies curriculum in California, a group of Jewish studies scholars released this openly published pamphlet sort of reflecting on Jewish studies versus ethnic studies. And of course, immediately just that binary upset me <laughs> because I, I didn't see it as necessary. And on top of it, I was wishing or hoping for more um, conversation about kind of the like structural processes that led to these divergences and these disciplines. Yes, ethnic studies has become clearly a, a great, you know, integrated into <laughs> neoliberal education, but Jewish studies, as this has already been mentioned from its inception in the 60s in the US. I mean, of course, there's a longer genealogy beyond the 60s, but the way that we see it today when we say Jewish studies was very consciously making a decision not to be black studies specifically black studies, because at that time, ethnic studies, the term wasn't necessarily as prevalent, and also to be nationalist. And so, and that, you know, reflects later on in the funding structures that are developed for Jewish studies, the reasons why, for example, there seems to be greater reliance on private money versus federal funding, you know, that infamous Title VI that can get taken away at the mention of the word Palestine. So, you know, I, I that's another reason why I'm here today, because I, I want for discussions moving forward to really, especially as we try to imagine our future to imagine, well, should we be relying on that private money? <laughs> should, sh or should we be surprised when someone withdraws their endowment of a chair um, because uh, a scholar signed a letter? Um, if that's the structure we've inherited over many decades, at least in Jewish studies. Um, Sorry, I think I went on a bit of a tangent, but I'll leave it at that. Tangents are welcome. Uh, I think I, I like that you ended with just proposing these rhetorical questions, Jesse, because again, perfect segue into kind of my final question in our final segment, um, which is, um, I think this theme of imagination speaks to what we're gonna do with the rest of our time. Uh, or you know a call a call to action. How do we move these concepts and critiques um, into meaningful and material action as um, teachers, as students, as organizers, as human beings who care about um, the colonial struggle, um, both inside the academy and and beyond. Uh, so how? Um, are you kind of each imagining um, from your own 
um, respective worlds. Um, this resistance, ongoing resistance against um, multiculturalism, particularly in your, your teaching, uh, in your curriculum, uh, in your organizing work, in your research. Um, we'd be curious, you know, who are you collaborating with? We know none of this work is done in isolation. Um, who from the past or present uh, is inspiring you? Uh, and um, what do you see as some of um, the kind of successes you've already had, you know, and we want to celebrate that. And, and what do you foresee as kind of some ongoing um, challenges to be vigilant to? And just to let the audience in on some notes that we uh, took as a, as a group in preparation for this conversation, um, we are thinking about, you know, future directions um, with regard to cross-disciplinary collaborations, um, right, taking down those imagined borders, um, that separate these imagined disciplines uh, and really, you know, reintegrating this role of religion and spirituality into how we think about race and race making under empire. Uh, so that's just an, to, to remind our panelists as well. Um, we were thinking along those those lines together. Uh, so I'll step back and um, maybe Nancy, if, if you want to um, start us off. Sure, Jesse, if it's not too embarrassing for me to do so, I'd like to make a quick plug for this conference we've been organizing. She's like, I see how you did that. <laughs> um, but I, largely because of a lot of shared frustrations that Jesse and I had about the ways in which um, these fields, Jewish studies, Sephardic studies, um, you know, Swana Jewish studies are organized. Um, uh, she and I and a colleague, Rachel Smith, together, we have organized this sort of conference that's happening um, in a couple of weeks, actually, a few weeks, May 2nd and 9th, um, called Reimagining Sephardic Studies. And it's not, it's it's no by no means perfect, but I do think that it, um, one of the great things about it is that um, we've tried to emphasize the work of emerging scholars um, and also scholars from within, from between different disciplines, right? And so not just historians, not just you know, anthropologists, not just musicologists, um, but but people from 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 uh, very different places. And one of the things that we wanted to do as well was think, well, okay, I mean, we, we keep talking about de-exceptionalizing uh, Jewish studies or the object of, objects of study that Jewish studies finds interesting. So why why don't we just do that? And so um, a number of our our panels have co have faculty respondents who are completely out of Jewish studies, um, whether they be in Asian American or indigenous studies um, or Middle East studies um, as a whole, right? Um, and these are all people who have done, um, I think their best um, to think about the ways in which um, we can tell better histories, at least at the very least um, of these structures of domination, right? Um, and so it's it's a start. It's obviously not perfect in many ways, but I think that there's a lot that we can do in terms of putting literal scholars in conversation with one another, as well as scholars in conversation with people outside of the sanctioned academy, right? I think that's um, extremely important. Um, one of the things that has been interesting to me, for instance, is um, sort of looking at the universities that do and do not support um, prison education programs. And of course, like that itself um, is implicated in a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion, Pause bara for this is the word that's coming to head my mind. Um, but at the same time, um, these are oftentimes degree granting programs um, that that give bachelor's degrees to incarcerated individuals. Um, and so I just want I, I I just think that these 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 two things are inextricably connected, right? Like what we study and how we study it, and who we actually teach and include and give degrees to in the academy. Um, and I I will not pretend to purport to you know have more experience than I do in terms of on the ground activism, though I have been and you know, um, I have also done that and been doing that. But I do think that at least in terms of thinking about how to make the academy more just, those are just a couple of ways to start. Uh, for me, um, I love your questions, Max. Who am I collaborating with and who inspires me? Um, well, from my personal history, you probably caught, uh, I didn't say it like this, but this is exactly how I feel, that the movement saved me. I was on this path of just accepting whatever the schooling system was telling me, whatever empire was telling me, and just being a good student 
and then the movements came. <laughs> so totally hearing what you're saying, Nancy, having conversations with folks outside the academy, especially what the way that it looked like for me was being part of a movement and then having to actually make this like life and death decisions that we never ever made in the university. The university is just mostly like just pontificating about a hypothetical, right? And there's a lot of confusion in graduate seminars, especially uh, because there isn't like a project that everyone's working on in common. Whereas with the movement work, it's all of this, you're doing a project in common and you are, you are uh, drawing from everything from the material world around you, from the street philosopher in the collective, from the dead philosopher named Spinoza, actually Jewish studies, shout out to Spinoza. Um, <laughs> I don't know if y'all talk about him, is he exiled in Jewish studies? I love that guy. <laughs> um, but drawing from everywhere, and, and it then started to make sense to me whereas it didn't make sense in seminars, it started to make sense to me in movements. And in particular, those movements that are really doing the work against empire, not trying to incorporate into empire, not trying to make themselves useful to empire so that they could be saved for a little while, but actually creating something else. And so the, 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 the major one for me right now that's alive is, is the Zapatistas in Chiapas. They are incredible political philosophers in addition to actual world makers, like their practice and their philosophy is, is one. There, there isn't this division how we have in the, in the academy. That's who inspires me. And of course, past movements, I mentioned the Panthers, the Black Panthers, they and the Zapatistas have a lot in common in what the Panthers were doing and now what the Zapatistas are doing. Uh, in terms of uh, Jewish studies and Palestine studies, which I've articulated with, Jewish studies, uh, I, I asked you if Spinoza was exiled from Jewish, I know he was exiled as a Jew, he was excommunicated as a Jew, um, but someone who is exiled from Jewish studies today is Mark Ellis, who is a Jewish theologian whose work I really love. He's really trying to save Judaism from Zionism. He's, he's talking about how, uh, you know, after the Holocaust, this, this, this question of where was God how could God have allowed this was an ans was answered by Zionism. Well, the state of Israel will never allow this to happen. And so then the conception of God shifts toward the state and he calls it a Constantinian Judaism, which is aligned with a Constantinian Christianity, how empire co-opted Christianity in the fourth century. So thinking at that level, at the level of, of spirituality, which to me is thinking at the level of metaphysics, is thinking about just the ways that we want to be in the world, ethics, the universe, the many worlds, the many universes. Uh, another person also that I think, and this is um, Elan Halavi, is someone who I was able to find uh, someone, and it was not recommended to me by anyone in Middle East studies, it was recommended to me by a movement person, uh, to talk about the, the inspiring history of Jewish autonomy that was taking place for almost 2000 years, for 18 centuries, until Israel destroyed it. So uh, something that a call to action, I mean, in Palestine studies, sadly, a lot of Palestine studies talks about it's it, a lot of it is it comes from the urban elite and from people who are trained in the Western schools in, the, in Europe or the US. And so you get a lot of really good stuff, but sadly it's articulating only with the West so that the West can love Palestinians. Uh, and there's very little coming out of Palestine studies that looks at what other movements are doing, Nancy. So when you say that, you know, this question, how could your studies care about non-Jews too? Like Palestine studies has this problem where it's really just about the Palestinian struggle. And even after the Arab Spring, massive divisions within it about do we care about Syria? Do we care about Egypt? Do we care about anybody else? Because Palestine had been the one rebellious movement in the, in the region for decades, the only one, well, according to Palestine studies. Um, and, and, and I think about the, the work of Vivian Sansur, who's a really dear friend of mine doing seed saving in Palestine. And, She's a, she's a really great example of someone doing something different in that her, her work doesn't just talk about what Palestinians lack, 
she talks about what Palestinians have, like what other worlds they are living in, you know, and and to me, that's what's so inspiring too about the Zapatistas. They have a critique, and they also have created other things. They they, and so engaging with each other, not in terms of just what we lack and, and just in terms of how we're oppressed, but what we have and what it is that we're fighting for to preserve and to keep, I think, I think that's incredibly important. And so I'll leave it at that. Um, but I do want to say really, really quick, because I didn't mention it earlier, the anytime we talk about CRT, critical race theory or ethnic studies, there is a backlash with people who are white people. And I, by that, I mean, people with light skin, people who are white adjective, who this country and capitalism also makes as the boss. And this is something Malcolm X taught me in one of his last speeches, that there's a difference between white adjective and white I'm the boss, and they go together in the US. And so how do we split them apart? And I feel like if we don't talk about the construction of whiteness and its corollary anti-blackness, because if you can't be white, then don't be black is what we're told, even if not in those words. The corollary of anti-blackness as its bottom pole of white supremacy on the top pole. If we don't talk about that, we're, we're going to continue normalizing white supremacy and anti-blackness as natural. We're not going to be able to see how we get sucked into it. And then and, and, and the important thing is how we can escape from it, all of us, no matter what our skin color is, no matter what we need a way out for us all. That to me is the great call to action. How do we create a way out for us all? My goodness, I don't know, even maybe I'll just take a second sit in that. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I'll start with first, who's inspiring you? Rabbinites and Karaites from the 10th through the 12th century throughout literature who are just living together, loving it, married, you know, not all this, you know, sectarian strife that we learn about later in medieval um, scholarship and Black Jewish women, who Chaim Zafrani only mentions in passing in his very long tome on 2000 years of Jewish life in Morocco. Ben Yeju, the merchant who Amitav Ghosh um, based his book in an ancient land on and went to the Malabar coast, got married and created a blended family as we would use in discourse of today way back in the 11th century. Um, Geraldine Hang and all of her work um, continually inspires me, especially for her concise definition of race that does not limit it to notions of scientific um, race that are modern. Leslie Feinberg and Butch, Stone Butch Blues, of course, forever. Uh, Palestine Youth Movement, Jewish Voices for Peace, organizations that just constantly give me life and I'm inspired by those who give their time to them and want and try to give mine as well. And how to imagine a future, I think I'm just gonna add on to what has already been said, especially by Kiki and we've brought up in other conversations, which is, you know, um, I think part of imagining a future for me from the position I sit at is understanding that Jewish spirituality really does not have to be imbued with Zionism. And I get a lot of that from Rabbi Lucia Pizarro, who hosts a weekly Torah group that my mom and I attend. I get it from the Jewish Liberation Theology Institute based in what is known today as Canada. And yeah, I'm just inspired to continue on by those connections and events like today's. If I could just jump in, Max, if there's no time, that's also fine. No, I was unmuting to kick it back to, to wow. you, Nancy, because I think you have a, an important addition. I just wanted to, and I actually realized it connected to a couple of things that um, I think Kiki said earlier, um, which I just wanted to say, you know, I, act, I, I am against nostalgia. I think, I think the best is to come. I also think that there's something potentially dangerous about the moral economy of nostalgia, about, you know, um, 
uh, and, and there are folks in, in queer theory, David Halperin, others who have thought through this a lot, um, but um, it's, it's not as if to say, you know, in the, in the past, and this is nothing that any of us are saying, but, um, but in case um, this is a way it could be misinterpreted, you know, it's not to say that there was no um, race in the past. This is why Geraldine Hing's work is so important. Um, not to say that there was no, you know, um, uh, systematic forms of domination in the past. This is why the work of other sort of medieval Islamic scholars, uh, Christina Richardson, Marina Rostow are, are so important, right? Um, but rather to think about the past, not as a sort of linear precursor to the present, but rather as a sort of set of kaleidoscopic resources through which we could think about creating better futures, futures that are completely not necessarily what we had before, and what we have now. Um, and because of that, I think my inclination is, is to think through, you know, why it is that despite the indefatigable, indefatigable human spirit, especially of labor movements worldwide for centuries, why it is um, that we got to, you know, the world that we got to today. And this 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 um, really great point that that um, Kiki brought up earlier about you know where are histories of capitalism, you know, in Middle East studies really triggered this in me because you know um, of course there there were and are numerous you know critical historians of capitalism in the middle in the modern Middle East both in the Arab world and the Anglophone world and the Turkish world and so on and so forth. But one of the in interesting things that's happened is that you know there's a way in which the work of Edward Said has been reinterpreted um, in the decades following that have were used to actually make post-colonial studies about identity and not about the sort of material conditions of possibility that created the sort of knowledge infrastructure of Middle East studies, you know, but also the sort of landscape of the Middle East as we see it today, right? And so I think a lot about the people who, the labor movements who have done the most, have risked the most. I think a lot about, for example, Iranian two-day communists who were, you know, Jewish, Muslim, and Armenian Christian, right? And were trying to resist um, forms of outside imperialism, right? Um, and whose efforts were in a way squandered when the US, um, or the CIA organized a coup um, to, to depose Mossadegh, right? Um, I think about these people, and I also believe that we can't separate those things from the things that happen, quote unquote, in the ivory tower, right? Because as privileged as we all are to be sitting here to have or be pursuing PhDs, it's also true that the university, like many of the institutions that dominate the people that we care about, are is also a corporation, right? And so I'm also really inspired by graduate um, student labor organizing movements um, in the US, um, by my own friends and colleagues um, at Columbia who organized tirelessly for 10 weeks, not to count <laughs> the years of organizing before that that required um, to get Columbia to the table. Um, and I guess my one cautionary is to make sure that whatever struggle we as individuals have the question we ask is who else's struggle is this related to, right? Um, whatever struggles we have in the academy with, you know, um, casualization of labor, how does this relate to domestic work in Latin America or next door, right? Um, whatever issues that we have in Jewish studies about the particularities of Jewish studies and racism within Jewish studies, okay, but how does this relate to processes of colonialism and knowledge production elsewhere? In the academy in the world. Um, so I think that for me, all of this and part of why this conversation has been so invigorating for me, inspiring for me, um, is that it's pushing us to actually expand our imagination, our historical imagination of who the proper subjects of Jewish history, Middle East history, so on and so forth are, um, but also our ethical imaginations of what is possible. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so we're kind of coming up towards the last few minutes. Um, I have not seen any questions in the chat or Q&A just yet. Um, anything else, Kiki or Jesse, any kind of last minute reflections or follow-ups? Um, 
I think the the thing that I would leave it with is is that I hope the little bit that I said um, it, from from the little bit that I said that it was evident that I understand all of us to be in this whether we want to or not. And so those of us who are we're all captive. We're captive in the above or the below, depending on context that shifts, right? And in the academy, we're above. We're supposed to be the above of intellect, which is so incredibly unethical to even understand anybody that way, that there are rankings in terms of intelligence because of what that does to the ways that we then treat each other. And so if we are all part of it and if we are interested in this question of justice, then we need to be struggling, actively struggling, not just writing about it, not just studying about it, which the, the academy wants us to just be studying about it and be then just our peers are not other people in struggle in movement work, but our peers are, are these uh, are our tenure and promotion committee are, you know, the, the peer reviewers of our articles. So if we, understanding ourselves as needing needing to decide, are we going to act, actively struggle? Or are we going to make a career out of writing about movements? Which is what I what I saw a lot in the university, and I left a, almost ten years ago. So hopefully it's changed. It looks like I was very excited to learn about you all and Max that you had studied Chicano studies uh, because I had studied Palestine. So I'm not Palestine. I don't have nothing to do with that part of the world, but I wanted to learn about other struggles. And, and, and I love that so much. Many of us have, I have other compas who are black and brown and, and have studied other struggles so that we can then learn from them about how we can struggle. And sadly, what we find is that other struggles don't want to learn about us, or if they do, it's just to borrow our slogans or our histories, but not understand us as also philosophers, as also great thinkers and theoreticians and analysts. So changing the relationship that we have to knowledge, I think is, is really key in, in addition to changing the relationship that we have with empire. Are we going to be antagonistic to it? Are we going to be, are we going to make ourselves useless to it? That actually means a rebellion because we're going to have to actively say no all of the time. And then how to sustain that? How do, how do we sustain that is by creating something else that can sustain us. That's the resistance portion. And I'll leave it at that. Jesse, any, any last comments? I, I understand I'm, I'm hesitant myself to, to add anything. Um, yeah, Kiki, I just, I wanna just riff off your, your acknowledgement that I, that I was trained in Chicano studies. I, I went to Chicano studies, um, because I became obsessed with, with Selena, Selena Quintanilla, and particularly the way that she was, uh, that she exists kind of as a spiritual figure, uh, in a lot of, um, uh, Mexican American, Latinx, uh, spaces, cultural imaginary. And that brought me into Chicano studies. And then after a few years, a lot of soul searching, uh, a lot of um, not knowing uh, up, down where I was going, I came back to the self and it ended up being the space where I learned about being a Jew. I learned about being uh, white. I learned about being trans. Uh, I learned about masculinity. And that was all kind of in the US-Mexico border space and lens, um, which, you know, we're talking about borders. It's, that's going to inevitably bring you to all the different border spaces um, across time and place. And uh, it, you know, you, you, I guess this is my pitch for um, that other groups and other spaces that seem like they have no connection with you are actually um, going to be places that probably have the most to teach you about, about who you are and how you can work together. And I want to lift up uh, this I think Kiki, this is a, a lesson that you were um, flagging from the Zapatista um, movement in Chiapas about um, this continual centering of, of what we have and abundance and not um, falling back on a scarcity model, not falling back on what we lack. Um, Cause I think 
that is so much of what I inherited in so many Jewish spaces um, about you know this need to center oppression, to center lack, to center victimization. Um, and all that does is leave us scared and isolated and traumatized and untrusting. Um, and so I guess my, my pitch is like, where can we be in spaces um, and educational spaces and like think broadly about where those exist um, that really center abundance um, and center um, generosity and generativeness, um, right? Because I think that is going to um, help us sustain that, you know, continually needing to show up for struggle um, every day, right? And rebellion. Uh, all right, so I wanna I wanna just thank this group so much. I I'm just such a student and learner and listener in this space, and it was a real um, my honor and gratitude to to facilitate uh, this incredible discussion um, and hold this uh, this platform. Um, and I won't thank Zoom because of all the reasons we started off with. Um, but again, thank you all and thank you to the attendees uh, uh, of, the, of the panel who, who stuck with us. All right. Thank you all. all right, so that concludes our, our program. Um, big thank you. Thank you, Max. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Noah. Sadly, I have to go teach in one and a half minutes on Zoom. <laughs> Thank but you, Kiki. So great to be with you all. And I'm going to end this. Take care. Yeah.